Hello everyone and welcome back to Asian Agash and in this video we are going to be talking about one of my favourite armies being of course the Slaves to Darkness and I'm going to be talking about my experiences on the biggest changes I've noticed on how the Slaves to Darkness play in their new battle tome but also in the General's Handbook 2022 to 2023 Season 2 compared to all of my hours of gameplay experience I have got in their last battle tome and the previous General's Handbook. I do plan on making an up-to-date, full, in-depth series on the Slaves of Darkness like I did before. However, I want to get more experiences on them in the new book before I make that kind of commitment to that series. So in the meantime, I wanted to share with you my first thoughts and my initial experiences, kind of my first impressions I've got within the new book and how I have learned through trial and error, essentially, how they play in today's world of Age of Sigma. Also, if you have a lot of experience with this army, what I will say, if you want to add to this conversation and share your tips and tricks, please put it in the comments down below. And if you have any questions that I didn't answer in this video, put them in the comments and I will try and answer them best I can. Firstly, starting with the main parts of the Slaves to Darkness being the Marks of Chaos. Whereas before I would build my whole army dedicated to one of the Chaos Gods and giving all relevant units their mark except for maybe one or two units if I couldn't do it, i.e. Bellacore was there or maybe I had some other kind of strategy going on. Um, the reason why I'd do this is as all your heroes would give a buff in aura to your units with the same mark of chaos, this meant you had a reason to make most of your army marked the same so it would be easier to make sure your units got the buff wherever they were on the battlefield whenever they needed it. However, now they replace that buff in aura system for just a passive every mark gives you a passive buff with the addition that each mark comes with its own command ability so now it's quite opposite and I find myself dedicating my units to a variety of gods because some of the command abilities you get from this if you're thinking well I'm still going to uh, mark my whole army the same the command abilities aren't really that great like for example the corn one is if your unit is dedicated to corn um, if it makes a charge, it gets an extra attack on all its melee profiles. Really good, but its command ability that comes with that is pick one of your corn marked heroes. It can then pick a corn marked unit, and on the charge, they get a two up D3 mortal wounds, which we see copy and paste in loads of battle tomes. So, like, that isn't really impressive compared to the passive ability you get. And don't get me wrong, I'd much rather this way, rather than you having to work really hard for the better ability, obviously. Um, so yeah, I think this is quite interesting because it means that although I have built and painted my army purely dedicated to the best Chaos God being Slaanesh, obviously, I find now when I'm playing with it, even if it breaks my heart a little bit having to dedicate different things, it's a lot better to not just stick to one god. Obviously, if you play, you know, narrative and fluff, do what you like. But in terms of competitiveness, you'll find that you are dedicating to several gods. And this comes into things like there's certain um, banners you get in the Slaves of Darkness battle tome. Again, I'm not explaining the entire Slaves of Darkness battle tome going to each civil rule. If you want to hear that, stay tuned for my long in-depth series. But like one of the banners is like the Nurgle banner that makes enemy units holy within 12 inches of your unit, which can be like a Chaos Knight. A Chaos Chosen, a Chaos Warrior unit, uh, minus one to their rend, which basically means it decreases their rend profile by one. So if they were minus two, now they're minus one, etc. And if you put that on a unit of 10 Chaos Knights, for example, a unit of just five Chaos Knights, that's a huge aura that you can affect the enemy. And myself personally, I'm not really a Nurgle fan at all, but I would dedicate one of my units of Chaos Knights to that to get that banner. Alternatively, there's things like um, Chaos Chosen, which are absolutely fantastic, which I'll go into later. And if you give them the Banner of Corn, they're plus one to wound, which now makes them with all attack, like hitting on twos, wound on twos, fantastic stuff. But like I said, those are two gods that I would never have marked my units with because my army is painted as Sinesh and converted as Sinesh, etc. But in terms of competitiveness, you just have to kind of bite the bullet on that one. But it also adds some variety to your army, so I don't really mind it too much. Also means if you're new to Slaves of Darkness, you can have some really fun um, building and painting different units to fit certain marks. And obviously you could have done that before. Um, and it fit like, you know, the narrative mark of, you know, being the Slaves of Darkness and they're all uniting just to conquer the realms, no matter what gods they support. But now in the terms of rules, it really supports that as well. So I think that's pretty good. And I think that the buffs are generally better. Some are better than others. Like, for example, the Zeech one is not as good as it used to be. Um, and I'd say the Slaanesh one 
is not as good as it used to be because it used to be like exploding sixes um, on hits, which was great. Uh, but some things have got better. Like I would say that overall the corn ones got better and you're not so reliant on those heroes. And I'd say Undivided's got better. Like to be honest, like one of the other examples I'd give is I would give a, quite a few of my heroes in this army the Undivided mark just because it helps their chance on the Eye of the Gods table. And that's what I'm going to get into in a minute. I'll be taking heroes that aren't so strong and powerful and mighty because I'll be taking units to do that job instead. And uh, with that, let's go into that point. So I would say that you are not taking powerful heroes anymore. You are instead taking powerful units. And the reason why I say that is because you've got some really fighty heroes in this. Like you've got a Chaos Lord and Manticore, really pretty good. A Chaos Lord and Carcatrack, still pretty good. Chaos Demon Prince, very good. But the problem is, compared to the units, and I, I mean basically Chaos Chosen, they are not as powerful enough. And you might as well, instead of trying to really focus on making your heroes killing machines which you can do in this army but you'd be better off making your units more powerful and things like uh chaos chosen which are obviously the best unit i mean the flat um melee profile as far as i can remember is like a two inch range three attacks each champion makes four attacks hit on freeze wound and freeze minus one two damage six is to hit do mortal wounds you chuck um, an extra attack on them if they charge through the Mark of Corn, which we just talked about. Now they're four attacks each, champion making five. You then put um, all out attack on them with that Corn banner. So then that means that now it's twos and twos to hit, which is an insane amount. Like, for example, if you've got a unit of 10 of them with a two inch range, they will be all getting into the fight unless you're very unlucky in terms of like um, positioning your models. If my mass is correct, you'll be looking at 41 attacks they can make. They can also do their once per game parlay attack twice in the combat phase, although that means the second time they attack has to be, I think, at the end of the combat phase, so the strike last rule applies to them. Um, but to be honest, like every time I've used them so far, they've wiped out whatever they've attacked. And then there are ways to make them be able to attack in the hero phase, through galley champions, etc., which we'll go into in a moment. Um, but yeah, Chaos Chosen are just flat out really, really good. Expensive in points, but they do a great job. But what I would say as well on this battle tome, this kind of comes onto the point that Chaos Chosen, Chaos Knights, Chaos Warriors have gone up in points. A lot of units in this army have gone up in points. And where you first read points increases, you are a little bit like, oh, great. Now my old list doesn't work, things like that. Um, like for example, I looked at Chaos Knights and I saw they went up in points. I was like, they were 170 before, I believe, and I was like, they're not even really worth that. The only reason I take them is I really like the look of the models, etc. Um, but when I saw they went up to 230 points, which I believe now they're 220 at times recording, they are really quite good. Like three attacks each flat with the lances, and again, you have to give them the lances now, unless it's the champion model or the Doom Knight, I think it's called. And again, that's a bit sad, but I always build mine with lances because I think it looks cooler anyway. So I don't really care too much. But I guess if you did build yours with um hand weapons, etc., it is sad times. But anyway, with the lances, three attacks each, champion makes four, um, two inch range, hitting on fours, wound on freeze, minus one rend, and then one damage. The reason why that's important is because they used to only be good on the charge. That means that when you charge the unit in, it would have to break through the enemy and kill whatever it charged. Otherwise, it was going to get bogged down in combat and have to slowly chew through the enemy and they would probably get killed. So what you've got now is just a flat rend, which is really useful, and more attacks. And obviously the horses are like two attacks, fours and fours, uh, no rend one damage, I believe. But you make them corn. All those profiles go up at one attack, so that's great. And then... If you get the charge off with them, you get an extra rend and an extra damage, I believe. So then that makes them really quite punchy, even a unit of five. They have a rule that makes them be able to get into range of combat a bit better, like, for example, attacking with their melee weapons. So you could take a unit of 10 of them if you wanted to. Um, even if you took them as Mark of Nurgle, you charge them in, they could still do some damage with that banner as well, which means that the enemy is going to be harder to hit you back and units around. So there's loads of fun you could do with knights and they have great mobility. Going on to Chaos Warriors, I think they have got so much better. Yes, you're paying more points to them, but what they can do now trumps whatever they could do before. So before, you would use them as a defensive unit because, you know, they're quite tough. Uh, two wounds apiece, four up save, I believe. Uh, we can make it a three up save. They have a ward save against mortal wounds, etc. They could hold an objective fairly well. But they kind of struggled to fight their way out of things. Like They did have two attacks each basic, I think, but you didn't have any rend on them now. 
you have two attacks each, freeze and freeze, minus one, one damage. I'm pretty sure it's freeze and freeze. So when you put like, for example, demonic power on them for a chaos sorcerer lord, if you want to, now it's twos and twos, put all that attack on them, it's twos and freeze, etc., etc. But what that means is they can really punch through and kind of like when they end up in a grind combat, hold an objective, they can kill the enemy unit that they are fighting, especially with things like their two attacks each. But if they're in range of a enemy objective, and I think there was something else as well, that means that they get an extra attack. So now it's three attacks each. So you take a unit of 10 of them, for example, that's 30 attacks plus the one from the champions. So that's 31 attacks. Um, all out attack, let's say, twos and threes, minus one rend, one damage. And that is just from what is your defensive unit. So that's pretty good that they are pretty offensive now as well. I'm a massive fan of Chaos Warriors. I think they're great. There's more ways you can buff them as well. Uh, I really do like them. So essentially what I'm saying is with these points increases, I think they're completely justified. And not just like justifying going, oh, well, I suppose they're worth the extra points. But in terms of, yeah, they're really quite good. And especially how in a recent battle scroll, I believe they called it, where they adjust the points and everything lately, uh, they came down 10 points worth the Chaos Knights. Brilliant. Love them. Take even more. So. Yes, if you're thinking about taking them in your army, it's like, oh, I don't really have anything punchy. They can still punch through things. Again, they're not going to be anything like Chosen or anything like that, but they are really, really good. Another unit, I would say, is very good and also came in that big starter set for the Slay Starkness is the Ogroid uh, Feodon, something like that. I haven't got their name right in front of me, so forgive me, but the unit of Minotaur-looking Slay Darkness guys who can either have a big axe with a shield or an even bigger axe without a shield, I think are really, really quite good. They were 190 points when I first started using them, and I think they're pretty good for that. But now they're 170 points, you're looking at three models in a unit. Yes, they've got like a five-up save, which is sad if you take them with the Great Axes, but I think the Great Axes are better. Um, you're looking at three attacks each, four for the champion. So from a unit of just three of them, it's 10 attacks, hit on freeze, wound on freeze, uh, minus two rend, three damage. You've got a thing where if they've taken wounds earlier that phase, you can plus one to their wound rolls, which is good, especially if the enemies lightly attack them. Now, the only problem with that is they have got a five up save. So if the enemies hit them hard, chances are it's not going to be worth the trade off at all. But if the enemies only just slightly attack them and done like one wound, if they've got like a small hero in range or something like that, and they fought their child, throw a couple of shots off, um, it could come back to help you. And they also have like a once per game ability, where I believe it's called like Unleash Savagery, where they actually get two. Um, add one to the attack characteristics. So now your unit of uh, three that was making 10 attacks is now making 13 attacks, which is nice. Um, but it means that they can't do inspiring presence later that turn, I think is what it means, because basically they're so angry that obviously you can't really like command them, etc. But uh, you can do command boost obviously on them still, which is good. And if you do that, like, oh, attack them now, it's twos and threes. And it's just a unit that you can have, which I found in my games was never really the unit the enemy would shoot at. It was never the one they focused on trying to kill in combat. Because I had things like Chosen on the board, I even tried out like Vanguard, uh, Chaos Knights as well, Warriors, etc., or Heroes, that they always kind of just like left like second picked or something like that to be attacked at or third picked. And because of that, their five up save didn't really affect them too much. And what that meant is that the enemy kind of underestimated them. And then when they hit and they were just wipe out half unit or even a small unit or something like that or kill an enemy hero etc it was a bit like oh didn't really see that so what i like with them is it was like for 170 points which i believe they are now it's just an extra threat you can have in your army like if you get into the end of your army list and go oh, i think i've got everything i need what do i spend the last 200 points on something like that chuck these guys in if you haven't already it's just an extra threat that can do damage and can punch through pretty well. So they've got five wings apiece. It is six uh, models as a council and objective, which is nice as well. And um, yeah, really, really quite tough. And if you take them in undivided, they can be given, um, which quite like, I think they can roll on the Eye of the Gods table, etc. And also you're given the Mark of Corn on the charge, you know, they get uh, 13 attacks instead of uh, 10. And then that means that if you do the Undy Savagery thing as well, it's 16 attacks from three models. So you take a unit of six of them if you wanted to, because the two inch range on their axis, but then coherency becomes a bit more a problem. But, you know, this is fun, and I look forward to trying out how many is a good amount for them in a unit. I only personally own three, though, so I probably will be rocking that for a little while. But I think for their points, um, yeah, a good unit, which is something that could caught the enemy off by surprise. And again, if your opponent knows that they're kind of pack a punch and they shoot at them because they go, well, they've only got five up save. I chuck something, get them, it shoots them at minus one red, and they've got six up save, 15 wounds, they will die. But 
that means that they're not shooting at your chosen, etc. So it's kind of a nice distraction unit, or if the enemy doesn't see it as a distraction, it can punch through like anywhere, obviously, from when you start getting in combat in the game, but if the enemy hasn't targeted it, then they're going to be around for a while, maybe to the end of the game, and that last punch at the end could do the deal, who knows, um, to secure victory. So I really do like them. So those are the units that stood out to me in the Slaves of Darkness, and that doesn't mean to say that there aren't any other good ones, they're just the ones that... I kind of focused on to see what I could do with them. Um, like, for example, Varangard is still good, but it's kind of a question like, Varangard are 290 points, I believe, for free. Chaos Knights are 5 for 220 points. Yes, Varangard are better than Chaos Knights, but for the extra 70 points, or should I just focus on taking some more Chaos Chosen in my army because they are better than Varangard? I feel like Varangard's sitting in a bit of a funny position now where it might still be worth taking a, you know, one of them, or if you really want to focus on, like, you know, the Knights of the Empty Throne um, sub-allegiance, you could obviously go really heavy with them there. But I feel like without any of those initial sort of buffs they get in that sub-allegiance, they're a little bit like... They're good, but I wouldn't focus too much on them. I'd rather just take Chaos Chosen and focus more about trying to get them into combat and use like Chaos Knights as the first wave, etc. to make sure that the Chosen get to where they need to. Uh, but Vanguard is still good, but for their points compared to other things, I'm not too sure. And the reason I mention them is because I've tried them out a bit and also they are kind of, or they were the big bad of the army so it's interesting to see where they sit now but like i said when i do a long in-depth series i'll review everything with a lot more detail and every unit in the army even the ones that nobody else talks about because the scene has not been very good i'll try and see what i can do with them like i've done that before with all the other armies but yes so going on to talk about the heroes when i said don't take really powerful heroes like i said do what you want but I see it as you want to be taking heroes along the lines of obviously that buff your army in a significant way and more importantly are galley champions. So obviously in this new edition of the General's Handbook, galley champions are huge. Of course there's going to be a new General's Handbook come out this summer and it might change things again, but at the moment galley champions are the thing. And Slaves of Darkness have loads of them. So just in case you're unaware, galley champions or Gallivant champions or whatever the word is, I don't know how to pronounce it. But galley champions, which shorter two we will be calling in this video, they are heroes that are less than 10 wounds and are not mounted or not unique. So not an end character, essentially not on a horse and not a demon prince kind of for this army. And why that is important is because they get initial bonuses in the game. Now, why do they get that? Now, essentially there's things like in the new general's handbook, they can't be shot at if they're within one inch of your battle line units, unless the enemy takes a battalion for their shooting units that specifically avoids that rule and they can still be shot off as normal. But the enemy has to put some investment into that. And then the other reason is because half of the battle tactics and half of the grand strategies or some of the grand strategies, from what I remember, evolve around having galley champions on the field. Now, you can still win your games without galley champions, but you have suddenly just put yourself in a position where you do not have as many options to pick from when it comes to battle tactics to score victory points, which obviously, coming from someone who spent most of the time playing Age of Sigma when it was just about objectives. I kind of still see battle tactics as like a new thing and kind of just think purely about objectives. But when you actually think about it, battle tactics are obviously very important and they can actually score you more points during the game, obviously, than objectives can. And your army, like I said, Slaves Darkness, has loads to choose from, like really go mad. And one that really stands out to me is an exalted hero of chaos. And the reason for this is because they are cheap at 100 points each they get a free roll on the Eye of the Gods table when you start the game, so there's a chance that you could become a Demon Prince. When I say there's a chance, there's things like if you take them all the Undivided Mark, like I do, that means that you get to re-roll one of the dice of your choosing when you do the Eye of the Gods table, and like say you do a free one at the start of the game after deployment. And also, when it comes to things like later during the game and you do an Eye of the Gods roll, there's like a heroic action you can do, so it means that you roll three dice, instead of two so you really do get a good chance of turning your guy into a demon prince you might just go i'm just going to pay another i think 75 points or 70 points for a demon prince on top and go i'll just get him straight away but that exalted hero it's a nice thing if they turn into a demon prince you know what a surprise but also they are a galley champion and that's the whole point so that means that there's things like i said battle taxes that rely on galley champions but there's also objectives in a lot of the battle plans now that are you score, you know, uh, one a point if you have an objective, another point if you have more than one, another point if you have more than your opponent, 
etc. But then there might be one like you score an additional point if you have a galley champion there, etc. So like it does really add up. And just having so many to spread around is huge. And the fact that they're only 100 points, you give them the shields so they'll be more survivable because you don't really want them to be as killed. You just want them to survive, essentially. Um, they have a free up save, a five up ward save. I believe it is against mortal wounds. And that makes them pretty survival. It is. Make sure there's a battle line unit nearby, like Chaos Legionnaires are a great example of that, or Chaos Warriors. You put a bit more points into it. And then that means that they can't be shot by the enemy unless they've got that shooting battalion. But then again, they still got to choose what they want to shoot with that. And if you've taken four, then, you know, target priority, etc. So suddenly you're here, you spend 400 points, you've got four galley champion heroes, which is huge. A lot of the time when, like, you look at list build, you might only have, like, one or two by chance. But if you really focus on it and have four there, you can still have a couple of slots to put more powerful heroes in there if you want to. But like I said, I want to focus on my units to try and be more competitive from my experiences so far. But you don't have to just take Exalted Champions. You can take a Chaos Lord um, on foot because then that means that he can pass on damage to his retinue unit he has nearby. You can take Chaos Sorcerer Lord for the Demonic Power spell, which is good. The um, Ocular Vision or whatever it's called, or Oracle Vision, however you pronounce it, uh, is not as good as it used to be, but it's still something that's free but you take him for his spell anyway, and he has got a bit cheaper. And that does mean that when you use him in the game, he is going to be useful for just being a galley champion. Essentially, you can spend a little bit of points on these foot heroes where before you might be like, what do they do? What do they really add? And now they have a role, they have a place, and you can have your units to do the killing, which I think is really quite cool. I like the idea of having like four exalted champions as well, because or four exalted heroes even because I have a one as it is, but then that means I can convert up three more and really have some quite fun with it, etc. And um, yeah, it's just a different way to play now, where before I would focus quite a bit on the heroes in Slaves of Darkness. Now you have these foot heroes that are really, really huge for the galley champion rules, and that can help you win the game, where some armies might struggle to have galley champions to be able to put on the board like, for example, you'll be talking to, I don't know, a Gargan player and they might be really jealous that you can have four caddy champions for the points cost of 400 while they really struggle to have any at all. So, yes, yeah, Slaves to Darkness have lots to choose from. The reason why I like Exalted Champions is because you get a free roll of the Eye of the Gods table, etc. And then nothing for the enemy to worry about too much. Like, the enemy will think, oh, it doesn't really add anything to your army apart from it's a caddy champion, which makes the enemy not really want to focus too much on killing them. But then... They do because they're scoring points in the objective and you've got so many of them so you can float them around the board. You're not like, I've got one or two, how am I best going to use these galley champions? You've got loads. So I'm a big, big fan of them. And like I said, Chaos Lord on foot's very good. Uh, Chaos Sorcerer Lord on foot. There are other ones out there. Like I'm not too sure how good the War Queen is and stuff. It's going to be a little bit reserved when I say things like that. But it does mean that you can take a lot of these small heroes that didn't have a place before, but now they have a place in the army. And not just a place, but they can be crucial to you or winning your games. And on that note, I just want to quickly talk about battle attacks and grand strategies. The Slave Starters have some good grand strategies up there. There's something like have one of your endless spells on the table when the game ends. One of your Slave Starters endless spells, particularly I believe it is, uh, which is something that you can quite easily achieve, especially if you go last in the last battle round. I mean, not guaranteed, but pretty easy to get off. There's one as well, like, roll um, on the Iron of the Gods table to become a Demon Prince. Like I said, you take a lot of Exalted Champions. It makes it easier to do so, which is big. And then there's things like the battle tactics, which some of them are quite easy. Some of them do acquire. You have a few heroes, though. Like, there's one of them, which is, like, have three of your heroes in range of an enemy hero, I believe it is, for one of the battle attacks at the end of a turn, which is quite a big thing to do, but it requires you to have quite a few heroes. There's one that requires you to like roll on the Eye of the Gods table, again, so it's quite easy to do that now, and there's good results you can get on the Eye of the Gods table, so do that, like, I think you have to pick a hero, but you, there's a spell that you can use to try and roll on it, but if you don't get that spell off, there's other things you can do in the game to try and roll on the Eye of the Gods table, so it's not too hard to do. And there's things like charge three of your units in, so some of their battle attacks are pretty good, so as an overall of their battle attacks and grand strategies, I think they're good. They're not a book that I'd say, like, they've got the best grand strategies and the best battle attacks. It's the easiest ones to get off in the game, but they're pretty easy compared to some armies um, I've seen out there. But yeah, so that's a quick review of that. And then in terms of like battalions and stuff, you've got a nice battalion which is basically fits most of your army in there, which is a one drop, but you might be a couple of units over. But I wouldn't really focus too much on being a one drop these days, um, unless your army really depends on it, obviously. And then there's a battalion to fit loads of Vanguard in there, which 
is what it is if you've got loads of vanguard i've only got personally like one unit in my collection so i don't really take that but if you really want to go knights the empty throne it could be really really useful for you because i believe you can do like all that attack or that defense um once per game for free which obviously could be very good on varangar they are very punchy but yeah so that kind of ends my review here again it was just going to be like a quick review like i think we're about 25 minutes in in this video so it sounds about right i just wanted to give you my um off the top of my head my thoughts about this army and where i see it in the game now my thoughts on the changes from before i still have lots more thoughts and stuff to talk about this army but i'll leave that for a long in-depth review if there's anything that you would like me to cover in that long in-depth review leave that in the comments down below if you've got any questions or my thoughts on it now leave it in the comments down below and also if you disagree with anything i said or you think you something you can add put that in the comments like i said at the start of the video because again like i say that i've been playing quite a few games like i've had five games with the slave startness in their new book and the new general's handbook in the space of like a couple of weeks or i think it was mainly about 10 days so i was pretty happy with that but i'm sure there's somebody out there who might have had like 20 games of them etc since the new book and the new general's handbook came out so let me and everyone else know your thoughts on that because at the end of the day we can all learn from each other and uh yeah that's it guys so i uh, thank you all very much for watching this video especially you got to this bit you got to the end so like i always say that's great to hear and i'm grateful very much for you listening to this if you did like it as well and you got to this point give it a like it's absolutely free it's just one click away um share the video if you think anyone else like this and subscribe if you haven't already because i will be making more videos these days and i was really happy to try and get this video out to you guys this is actually the second time me recording this video it's meant to come out about five days ago probably compared to when it's been uploaded now but essentially the software i used to record that video uh, which was a new software because i got a new laptop compared to what i used to make my videos um, when i click save the video at the end it uh, crashed and couldn't recover the file so that was a bit annoying and essentially i set aside like time to be able to call the video then and it was always time which like i said i haven't got a lot of time moment, so it was annoying but here we are and we've got the video out to you now so i hope you enjoyed it and uh, i can't wait to make new videos i also popped to my games workshop uh, the other day to get the soul black grave laws battle tome and the australian bone reefers battle tome and i will be doing a review on those as well um like i said i haven't got as many games of them shall we say in the new general's handbook and since the new battle tome obviously it will kind of just be my initial thoughts with no games so far it will be interesting to see what i think about the changes straight away however those are videos for another time which i hope you look forward to and with that guys i thank you very much for watching this video if you do want to support me in Patreon YouTube membership, there's a join button there. There's a link to my Patreon down below. For everyone who does do that, a huge thank you to you guys for the massive support you always give to the channel. Like I said, a lot of that money lately has gone to for charity, so it has gone to good causes. Don't you worry about that, even when I wasn't making the videos. But here we are back at it. So I thank you all very much again for watching this video. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I hope this has made you a bit more excited to get on with your Slaves of Darkness and come up with new strategies and building and painting them and playing your games. Until next time, guys, remember to have fun when you're playing, and Nagash is all, and all is one in Nagash.